it's really um, a true honor and pleasure um, to welcome Michelle Hoko. Michelle is uh, a dear friend of mine, uh, so it's an especially nice honor. So just to tell you a little bit about Michelle. Michelle has a diverse background in bioinformatics and genomics. She was a presidential innovation fellow where she worked with basically every government agency known to man. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but some examples are Homeland Security, BARDA, and in particular the All of Us program, which will be relevant to her talk today. And she also recently um, uh, left Google as the principal architect within the Google Cloud public sector, where we had the opportunity to meet and work together. Today she's going to explore how digital health technologies are taking the world by storm and helping us to understand the challenges to using these data in a variety of different contexts so that we can use them for maximal health benefits. Take her away. Awesome. Thank you so much, Melissa, and thank you. I'm very excited to be here. A huge thank you to Larry for creating this community of just really thoughtful people. And I'm especially grateful to Phil um, for going first because now I realize that I know nothing. Um, and so it's going to be really easy to be humble. Um, and so, you know, as we go, feel free to, to challenge kind of what, uh, what we're talking about here. Um, and, you know, to that end, I, I always like to start with a disclaimer. You know, the, the things that I'm talking about here um, don't represent any of my prior or future em employers. Um, you know, these are just kind of things that I've gathered along the way um, through a very uh, kind of uh, cobbled together course. Um, and I think one of the things to note is that um, I have done a lot of jumping between sectors throughout my career, and so I've had an immense opportunity to see not only the academic research side from my PhD and postdoc experience, but, but also you know, how things are working in the public sector, what that mission space looks like, and then also you know, from big tech company like Google um, and, and kind of the technology innovation that's happening um, at that pace. Um, uh, two other, one other disclaimer, um, I was going to potentially use generative AI in my talk. I, I don't think I did, actually, um, but would reference it accordingly. I think that's going to be a disclaimer or, or something that we're going to have to start doing is kind of notating things. Um, there's some interesting research, which is a total aside, on, you know, building in watermarks to things that have been developed with generative AI, just so that, you know, people are able to, to see that. Um, and then lastly, I have um, lately been including in all of my talks my favorite Einstein quote, and I didn't this time, so I just want to share it now um, because I've been reminded of it by Phil, um, which is, um, if we knew what we were doing, it wouldn't be called research, would it? <laughs> so here we go. I don't know what I'm doing. We don't know what we're doing. Um, so, so basically, I always like to start with the bottom line up front. So if you don't know government speak, bluff means bottom line up front. Um, my thesis is that this kind of N of one, or considering each of us as unique individuals, um, is needed to, um, to really deeply link the data that we're starting to gather from digital health technologies to useful applications, and what does that look like? Um, and then I would also say um, that I, I think that signals from these types of devices are potentially one of the new omics. Um, you know, we've, we've done a lot, I've done a lot in the genomic, um, in proteomic space, um, in metabolomic space, and certainly Larry does a lot in the proteomic space. Um, and I think that, um, you know, there are some unique features about these data that um, make them particularly meaningful. Um, and then, you know, just the outline of, of what we're going to talk about. So some of the key themes throughout. Um, data are really the foundation for discovery and insight. Um, and I think that's one of the common themes is, you know, how do we understand data and then derive information and meaning from that. Um, the technology uh, is amazing and can enable, but it's really only useful if people use it. <laughs> and I think that people really are at the heart um, of what we're trying to solve for. And I think sometimes we get lost in the technology, so really coming back to the people. Um, Cross-sector partnerships, I've seen um, a lot more of that happening um, throughout my career. And I think that's one of the areas where, um, you know, we really need to continue in that way, especially when it comes to issues like health equity. Um, and then proactive security. I've also um, spent some time working on cybersecurity issues related to biotechnology, and I think um, especially when you're developing new technologies and evolving new data types, there are risks that you haven't thought of. Um, and so when you're developing something with only the intended use in mind, you're missing a lot. Okay, so 
uh, what do I mean by digital health technologies? And this is where I was considering, I had asked Bard what um, Bard thought about digital health technologies, but I didn't like the answer. So um, I, I made up my own, and, and FDA has one, and uh, a lot of different groups have their own. But, but what I think digital health technology is, is the use of digital devices and technologies, so it could be apps and other types of software, to understand health, wellness, and physiology. And you'll note that I don't specifically call out clinical practice or medicine. Um, because I think we have to consider health as much more broad than that. And it's not even just your kind of usual definition of wellness. I think that there's, um, you know, this really opportunity to understand ourselves deeply at a, at a physiological level. Um, a, a couple other kind of um, features of digital health technology. Um, I really like this, where ones and zeros meet, meet flesh and blood. It's just really easy to, to think about that. Um, and it also captures the fact that I do not consider EHR data or health record data that uh, another person kind of put into a software um, about you to be digital health technology because it's not meeting your, your flesh and blood where it is. Um, these are, so I have an Apple Watch and a, a Fitbit on. Um, so, you know, one of the, the other features that I think is really interesting about this space is that it's, it's something that I am starting to incorporate in my life um, and we'll talk about, you know, kind of the, the personal nature of, of what that looks like. Um, devices, um, you know, are capturing health-related signals. Um, sometimes we're talking about these as digital biomarkers. Again, this is kind of an evolving term and an evolving field. Um, and uh, there's a lot of work going on there. One of the most important digital biomarkers is your heart rate, right, that's captured by one of these devices. And interestingly, they're not the same. Um, so my, the, my heart rate on my Apple Watch and my heart rate on my Fitbit are not the same. Um, and there's a lot of work that's going on to try to figure out how to standardize that. How do we make a heartbeat a heartbeat based on the different ways of measuring that with all of these different devices? Um, and it's not trivial. Um, so, that it, again, it takes a village. Um, the devices can be wearable devices like watches. There are also some implanted sensors. Um, I'll talk about one um, in particular that, that the DOD and DARPA invested in when I was there. Um, they could also be environmental sensors, and there's a lot of work going on um, to use the sound of your voice to understand um, things like co cognitive decline, early onset of cognitive decline. There's also a really interesting uh, device that was developed out of an MIT lab that um, is, is a device that just sits in a room, and even if you're not in that room, if you're within a certain radius, um, even with a wall in between, it notices your gait and it can tell you if your gait is off. Um, so this is uh, really highly useful for people with Parkinson's disease who may forget to take a medication, and you can actually see in that data, you know, on days that they've forgotten to, to take their meds. Um, and um, yeah, okay. So lots of data and information um, are coming off of these devices. Um, and I put this up here just uh, to give you kind of a, an overview of the fact that there is a lot of data. But my main point of, the, of this is not that, um, is, is not that the, these data are all ripe for us, you know, kind of in the research arena to start to mine, because the, the bottom line is you don't always have access. Even, even the devices that I have on my body, I don't have access to the raw data um, that's coming off of those devices. Um, I have access to this processed or inferred data um, that gets processed by Fitbit and Apple. Um, and I think that's one of the core issues uh, with these types of technologies is that, um, you know, a lot of this innovation and algorithm development is happening behind closed doors in the private sector, in large tech companies that are developing the devices, um, and, and trying to figure out how to, um, what that means, um, and, you know, if there are any types of algorithm biases, it goes back to this, how do you measure a heartbeat type of a question. Um, it makes it really challenging, um, to the point where, in um, some of the research that's, that's gone on, especially in the early days, some of the folks that have been working on this in the, in the um, academic side, um, one of the first things that they would discover was whenever there was a new software update, because there's not, um, you know, they don't publish when there's a software update, they just push the software update, um, but it changes things, and they're constantly tweaking the algorithms, and you can see that if you dig into the data and you try to start to analyze it and infer things. Um, okay, so why do I care? And this is a bit more of the why do I care from the professional side. Where have I touched um, di digital health technologies throughout my career? Um, so the first time, and this was really a surprise, um, so I spent about five years at DARPA 
Um, and for those of you who, who don't know, DARPA is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, which is part of the DOD, the Defense Department. Um, and it's basically the go big or go home research agency that was created after Sputnik to prevent strategic uh, surprise based on technology. So they are credited with investing in, t in technology development that resulted in the creation of the internet. Um, they do a lot of robotics. Um, uh, one of the coolest programs, or coolest, one of the most interesting programs that one of my friends is leading right now is about biomanufacturing in space. <laughs> so um, lots of far, far forward stuff. Um, and you know, some of it's in the classified space. This was a total unclass um, uh, program that, um, that I was leading. So this was called the Prometheus Program. Um, I was actually working in the Prevent the Next Pandemic portfolio at DARPA um, way before COVID. Um, so we were investing in, in mRNA-based vaccine technology, Moderna and others. Um, but this program was really about trying to understand what, um, what, are the, what is the earliest signal to contagiousness? So, you know, if you think about the infectious cycle where, you know, I am exposed to, I walk by someone that has COVID, I'm exposed to that, I may clear that and not become infected, or I may become infected and then become contagious, and I may become contagious before I even know that I'm sick, right? So the, the further you can get to that, am I infected and am I going to become contagious point, the better your chances are of stopping that epidemic spread and, um, and preventing a pandemic. Um, so the, the, the core of this, um, this program was um, you know, multi-omic. Uh, we were really focused on the omics, um, the molecular omics, uh, multi-pathogen and multi-host. So there were animal studies um, all the way up to non-human primates. Um, there were a lot of different uh, pathogens, mostly viruses. Um, and uh, there, were, there was even a human challenge trial of flu. Um, uh, interestingly, there, there's also been human challenge trials of dengue, which I find fascinating that people actually volunteer to get infected with dengue virus. But, um, but anyway, the, the thing that was surprising about this program was that, you know, again, we were really investing in the omic space, the molecular space, um, but what actually ended up being the most informative were signals that were coming off of telemetry devices that were implanted in the, in the monkeys and wearables on the humans. Um, and it was a total surprise. It was not something that we put into the program initially, um, but you know, let's try it and see what happens. Um, and I think you know, that was, was interesting. And I think one of the reasons is because you know, we are also different in terms of the way that we're gonna mount uh, an immune response. And even though our time points you know, were kind of harmonized across the entire program, my time point is totally different than what's gonna be relevant to your time point. And you may totally miss the right time point in order to try to capture at a molecular level. Um, so you know, that brings me to this point of it's really all in the data. And even the, the frequencing sampling, uh, or, or the, the sampling frequency of the data, I think is critically important because biology is all about cycles. Um, and in this case, you know, we're thinking about the non-infected, happy, healthy cycle going into sick and then recovering. Um, but there are cycles happening in biology all the time. And I think that's one of the reasons why the molecular data are so noisy um, and, and challenging to, to discern. Um, and so one of the models in this Prometheus program was it was really, um, you know, after we, we realized that and, and then with future, um, future efforts that we started funding, the idea was, well, what if you could use a wearable to signal to a person, you may be infected, you may become contagious, you should go take a test, or you should stay home tomorrow um, because, you know, you, ha you don't have symptoms yet um, and, and, you know, not risk uh, infecting other people. Um, so that was really the model. Um, and I think one of the reasons why I like this, the infectious disease model, um, you know, not only because it's been incredibly useful and, and this work has expanded um, in a lot of different ways throughout the pandemic. Um, and it's really exciting to see, you know, the, this true, true algorithm development around what that looks like. Um, but, but I think because it speaks to the fact that it can be important at the individual level, you know, for me, my decision making about, am I gonna go to work tomorrow? or am I gonna stay home because I don't wanna get people sick? Um, and at the, potentially at the population level of you know, me making decisions you know, that benefit my community. 
Um, so, so then, um, the next time that I encountered digital health technology and had the opportunity to work in this space was um, a couple years after that, um, I was um, a White House Presidential Innovation Fellow and detailed to the NIH All of Us Research Program. Um, and the, uh, the All of Us Research Program, if you're not familiar, it's a it grew out of the Precision Medicine Initiative, which is one of Obama's kind of first priorities when he came into office. Um, and it got a billion, billion dollars of congressional funding to go off and do precision medicine research um, and really build a, a diverse data set um, you know, that, that has all of the different types of omics. Um, but really, the, the diversity of the participants um, is one of the most critical pieces of this program because unless you have diversity in your participants, you can't actually do precision medicine. If it's all, you know, 50-year-old white men, you're not going to learn anything about me <laughs> in that data set. Um, and, you know, one of the, the, when I first came to the program, um, they thought that they wanted me to help them with their genomic data because um, that's my background and, uh, you know, that's what I did my training in. But when I got there, I realized they didn't actually have genomic data yet. And, um, you know, I was on a one-year fellowship timeline and so said, well, what data do you have? Um, and they said, well, we have this Fitbit data, but it's not really a priority. We're not really going to do anything with it. And I said, if you'll let me, I'll do something with it. And so thankfully they did. Um, and so because of that, we set up, um, we, we set up this uh, kind of curation schema for the Fitbit data. There's now um, 15,600 uh, apparently records of Fitbit data in this data set. Um, and so, you know, the, the, we are starting to have, um, you know, data available for research. Um, and and I, f I think it's incredibly important because, um, you know, in the blue box where, you know, the kind of the three things, the biology, lifestyle, and environment, you know, the, the genetic data is really great for the kind of biology part and, you know, your potential. But when it comes to lifestyle and environment, um, you know, really the only other thing we have is surveys. Um, and, and again, you know, there's potentially biases there um, and, you know, how do we know even what we, things that we think we know. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the digital health technology data really have an opportunity to help inform what's happening with environment and lifestyle and, and tease out some of those things. Um, and so I'm, I'm happy to share that, um, you know, I guess these are five of the most, uh, five of the most cited papers that reference the All of Us data set in the last couple years, and three of them um, were using the Fitbit data. Um, and I'm going to talk more about the one that's at the bottom about um, some of when we talk about some of the kind of health equity issues. Um, but the data that are available right now are um, kind of your heart rate daily kind of zone summary stuff. Um, minute level heart rate, minute level activity, and um, your, your daily activity summary. They are getting ready to release the sleep data, um, which I think is going to be really important because I think sleep is one of the areas where we really need to, we really need a, a better measure of quality of sleep. I think, um, you know, the, the gold standard of the sleep study is uh, flawed. Um, okay, so a little bit more context of the where we are um, and you know what what this uh, community is looking like. Um, so you know I think one of the one of the things that was really present in my career early on uh, because I was in the field of genetics um, is the way that technology the evolution of technology impacts what we're able to do um, and to understand from a science and research perspective. Um, and really, you know, the enablement of uh, r genetic sequencing at scale, um, going from, you know, the $100 million, um, you know, human genome project to 100 um, in 2021, it's fascinating. Um, and, and because of that, you know, it, it may actually be um, possible to now, you know, do whole exome sequencing on every newborn. Um, to find rare diseases. Um, and so I think, you know, that is, is one of the things that, you know, we've, we've made tremendous advancement there. And yet, I feel like when we're, when we're thinking about our goals with precision medicine um, and really understanding how our genetics make up, you know, make up all of, all of the, our health issues, um, I think there's so much more that goes into it. And this environment and um, lifestyle factors are a huge part of it. So I would love to see some of that happen. And then, you know, this is not a surprise, but just to, to bring it into the, to the discussion, you know, life expectancy in the U.S. is we are doing a terrible job of that. Um, it's trending down um, while spending on health care is outsized. And so, you know, this is one of the reasons why I, I don't think that the right answer is to 
try to pull these devices into this kind of clinical um, setting. I, I really think that we need to start thinking about health in a much more holistic way and not just in clinical encounters. Um, the digital health technology market is growing. So, you know, I'd love to, to think about how can we take advantage of this growing market um, again to, uh, to develop technologies that end up being really useful um, and, and that people will use and will help them on their health journeys. Um, so some of the fields and, and kind of areas where there's active research development, testing, evaluation, and application, um, a lot of the, the digital health technology research started really with activity monitoring and, and behavioral health research. Um, and was, when I was doing my postdoctoral fellowship at Northwestern in Chicago, um, the other uh, fellow that, that um, I was, you know, kind of working side by side with, she was squarely in this space. Um, and, you know, interestingly, the, the uh, model was really using you know, step counters, Actigraph was one of the most popular ones. And the reason for that is because with Actigraph, you can get the full raw signal. Um, and so still some people prefer to use those types of devices in their studies. The UK Biobank actually had a um, wearables thrust to, uh, to that study, and it was, a, it was a pedometer because they wanted the raw signal. And so their model was to, um, this is fascinating, um, was to send every, um, in, so they bought a certain number of devices, not enough for everybody. They would send out a device to you if you were a participant. You would wear it for uh, one or two weeks and then you would send it back to them, and then they would send it to someone else. So they would get two, two, up to two weeks of fully raw signal on you. Um, and one of the things that's fascinating about this is that um, they had a 100% return rate of those devices. <laughs> I think um, that's just, that would not be possible, I think, in, in the United States, um, to the point where, um, you know, the, the All of Us program, um, started this WHERE study where they were div uh, distributing Fitbit devices. You know, so the data that I talked about that I, I helped with was bring your own device model, right, where you had to have your own device. Um, but they partnered with Fitbit to, to distribute devices to people. Um, and within a week, uh, there was like a Facebook community that put it out as like free stuff. You know, hey, you want a free Fitbit? Go sign up for all of us, and they'll send you a Fitbit. Um, and so they had to pull it down and, and rethink how they were going to distribute devices so that that didn't happen. Um, anyway, um, just just a funny thing. But but I don't I don't actually think that the, the UK Biobank model of getting raw data for two weeks is as meaningful as you know data that I of a device that I'm wearing. Even patterns of how I'm wearing the device I think is interesting and useful information. Um, so some of the other areas where these devices are really being used are certainly with elite athletes. Um, there's a huge community out there, and I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail of, of some of the devices there. Um, women's health, human performance optimization in extreme environments. Um, the DOD in a lot of different parts of the DOD is investing in this space. Um, again, there are some challenges there, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, infectious diseases and health security is, again, another one. Um, uh, chronic diseases, including long COVID. Um, anecdotally, I have some friends and colleagues who are suffering from long COVID and actually use wearable health device, wearable devices to help them monitor. Um, and and the I guess the learning there is that you know one um, one person she has learned that if she overextends herself, she's much more likely to have kind of a resurgence of long COVID. And so it's more about like understanding your own kind of rest and recovery cycle and how much you have in your quote unquote battery internally and being able to, to kind of dial it back. Um, Post-surgical monitoring is also a really big one. And again, some, in some cases, these are medical devices, but a lot of what I'm talking about, these are not like FDA approved cleared medical devices. Um, and then also seizure disorders, and especially for children. Um, and, and I'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, okay, so the Scripps de Detect study. So Scripps um, is one of the academic research centers that's doing a lot of this work. Uh, the Detect study is just one of them. They also have a really awesome um, maternal um, health program. Um, but this was basically a kind of an expanded version of what we had envisioned with Prometheus, um, you know, on the wearable side. Um, and I think one of the w features of this is that it really does require cross-sector partnership to achieve this. So, you know, Apple is one of their partners. Um, Care Evolution is, again, another kind of uh, digital health technology company that's helping them uh, with this study and others. 
Um, another kind of public or private sector company um, in this space is Evidation Health. And um, when I was at DARPA, we invested in, in Evidation Health um, and in their kind of early days. Um, and their model is fascinating. And I don't think their model is bad, but I do think that there are reasons why um, we need to do other things too. Um, so their model is they've created this app. It used to be called the Achievement Platform. Now I think it's just called My Evidation, where you can become a member and you can donate all of your wearable device, um, device from, or, or data from your phone, whatever. Um, and you can elect to donate your device, um, specific types for a specific amount of time, to various studies. Um, so research studies that pharma want to do or whatever. And so they partner largely with big pharma companies um, to do these studies um, and give them access to this, uh, this uh, cohort of almost five million members. Um, so that's pretty impressive. Um, and um, I think, again, I think this is a good model, but um, not, there's not a ton of access in the research space. Um, but in terms of some of this, like how do, you, how do you decide what a heartbeat is and do that kind of cross-platform work? You know, Evidation is one of the, the groups that's actually able to do some of that because you know, they're sourcing Garmin and, and Apple and Fitbit and, and lots of different devices. Um, another kind of uh, public sector, I'll talk about a couple more kind of public sector thrusts in this space. Um, BARDA, um, uh, under Department of Homeland uh, Health, and Human, Health and Human Services, um, BARDA is the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority. Um, and they do things, traditionally, Big BARDA does things kind of towards the end of that regulatory, uh, FDA approval um, life cycle. Um, they manage the strategic national stockpile, so things that um, we might need in a, in a health security emergency. Um, they fund the development and scaling of the flu vaccine every year, so these kind of really big kind of public health things. But they started this division of innovation research and ventures um, towards the end of my time at DARPA, and then I spent a little bit of time helping them get that stood up. Um, and this program was one of their first, and it was called an ACT, Early Notification to Act, Control, and Treat. And it actually was an interagency partnership between DARPA and BARDA um, to transition the Prometheus program to BARDA. Um, and then they totally expanded um, what they were doing in terms of investing in devices um, that have health security applications. So Spire health tags on the, on the top left there, um, they're really interesting. So they are wearable, um, but you wear them in, um, in the band of your underwear or bra, um, and they measure respiration. Um, but again, they're, they're able to get this, these really amazing raw signals um, because it's faceless, um, so the battery life is pretty long. Um, and, and they even have developed it in such a way that you can like put them through the washing machine. It's incredible. Um, Sonica Health is a little um, uh, kind of wearable, flexible wearable that you wear on your throat. Um, some of the applications there are in any type of cough or lung disease, COPD and others. Um, BioBeat Bio is another wearable device, and Resonance, um, I actually just talked with the CEO of Resonance earlier, a, a couple weeks ago, and I find this fascinating. So what they have done is they, it's not a wearable device at all. It's basically a software application that you can sit, that, you know, can sit on your phone, um, and you cough near it, and it's a diagnostic for COVID. <laughs> wow. Right, fascinating. Um, and so they, they, um, they submitted an EUA to the FDA, and, and we'll get to kind of some of the, the issues in this space in terms of the regulatory stuff. They submitted an EUA to the FDA, um, and FDA sat on it for like six months, and then said, oh, we're not doing EUAs anymore. Um, and I think potentially part of the reason why that might have gotten held up is because the, the success of that depends on AI, right? And a FDA is just now trying to figure out how are we going to regulate um, AI that's built into medical devices and, and medical applications. You know, this is software um, in this case. Um, so I, I, I think that this is a really fascinating, um, fascinating topic. Um, they're also working on um, some other things. And the other thing that's really neat about Resonance is that they have kind of two thrusts built into their company. One which is kind of the more com commercial application that is gonna be more profitable for them. And that one is focused on um, smoking cessation, vape cessation, and other types of kind of lung injury and recovery type of scenarios, where your, your baseline is your kind of injured state, and you're trying to recover from that baseline. 
Um, but their other thrust is this digital, um, uh, digital diagnostic um, thrust where they recognize that the global health need for this kind of digital diagnostic is huge, and so they're probably not gonna make a lot of money on it, um, and yet they know that it's important work. And so by having both of these arms built into the same company, it's almost like a Robin Hood model um, with, within a single company. I think that's really uh, innovative, and I love that. Um, so athletes, um, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about kind of my fitness journey um, towards the end, but um, you know, uh, the athletes are really one of the biggest users of these types of devices. Um, and again, because it, it helps you helps you understand like where when you need to rest, um, you know what's happening with your physiology, um, really to protect against um, injury um, in, in a lot of ways. Um, so here are some of the sensors. Um, you know, athletes tend to really like Garmin devices. Um, apparently, there's an Apple Watch Ultra. I had never heard of this until I was putting this together, um, but that's focused on athletes. Um, and Whoop is one of the, the other devices on the top left um, that, uh, again, and I think it's because they give you access to your full raw data and lots of different types of data. Um, Whoop is also faceless. And I think that's an interesting feature. Um, you know, so m my mom has an Apple Watch, and um, I think she mostly uses it to like be connected with her phone on her body and like get notices and use it as a watch and stuff. And, and I think that's a, a very different kind of an application of a smartwatch um, versus these that are kind of collecting health rel relevant data. Um, and then NYX is um, a sweat sensor. So it um, kind of sits on your skin, has kind of a micro needle patch type of interface, and it senses um, hydration, but also electrolyte balance. Um, okay, so the DOD is investing in digital health technologies. I told you about some of, uh, some of the DARPA investments. Um, so Profusa is the implanted device. So it's this little kind of micro gel filament that gets implanted under your skin. Um, and right now they sense glucose and oxygen. Um, and then you wear a sensor over top and, and the sensors can monitor that molecular marker in real time, which is fascinating. Um, the DOD was, was um, funding them to work on um, a, uh, a blood lactate sensing so that it, it's like a general sign of infection type of a thing. Um, and, um, and then they've also deployed aura rings. Um, they've used all of the devices basically. Um, and one of the challenges that the DOD is having, so in addition to kind of, um, you know, at the Pentagon level having these investments, um, also, you know, within each of the service branches, they've been do doing some testing on various um, use cases. Um, but one of the challenges with the DOD is the acquisition process. And I don't know if you're familiar with the acquisition process in the DOD, but it's, um, it's really crazy. You have to literally spell out like every feature in advance um, and with technology that's evolving so rapidly, it's impossible to do that. Um, and so uh, that's one of the challenges that the Defense Innovation Unit has, um, and I hope that they figure out a, a path. Um, the VA um, has also partnered with Fitbit um, to di dist and distributed 10,000 devices. Um, I think they're expanding that. Um, one of the, the things to note here is that they are also now starting to build a dashboard and allowing veterans to opt in to donate their data um, to start to do health research. But, um, you know, kind of a missed opportunity. At the initial deployment, they didn't have that thinking uh, in, in, in their mind, and so they didn't actually deploy them with the consent process for that. And so, uh, you know, again, missed opportunity, but they're, they're playing catch up a little bit. One of the reasons why I think it's important to talk about the work that's going on in the DOD and the VA space in particular is because oftentimes, especially when we think about health and healthcare, a lot of the innovations come from DOD investments. Um, and it's easier on the healthcare side um, because they're, you know, they do healthcare for <laughs> their veterans and their service members. Um, so there's actually an opportunity to have all of the data together um, in some way. Um, and then just another um, interesting on the kind of, um, you know, private sector side again, um, Owlet is a, uh, basically just a pulse ox. Um, and um, mostly what they're targeting here is um, kids coming out of the NICU um, that might have been born too early um, or have other issues. And, and I'll, t I'll talk to you about why, why this is interesting to me. Um, but the other thing that's really interesting with kiddos is the, um, the epilepsy um, devices. Okay, so what are some of the security issues? Because there are some. Um, so, you know, whenever you think about technology and information systems, you know, you think about the basic 
go back to basics, the CIA triad, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and being able to make sure that you're able to verify these at all times. Um, privacy is also a big question. You know, we have HIPAA, um, but HIPAA only covers a very specific type of data. Um, there's been a lot of prog progress made in the genomics data space, um, and I feel like this is, again, another area that, that is ripe for the need of innovation. Um, it, it just uh, there, also, one of the papers that came out of Evidation a few years ago is that minute level Fitbit data is enough to identify a person, right? And so there are, there are issues there. Um, and again, anytime you know, you're developing a new data type, type you have to think about um, the unintended uses um, and things like that. So again, new technology presents new risks. Um, you know, that we had a lot of um, increase in medical and um, hospital hacking um, over the pandemic, um, and certainly medical devices are a weak link there. Um, no different with your, with your devices as well. Um, there also have been some data breaches, and again, you know, we, we really don't know. And, and this is one of the most impressive, though, I think. Um, so Strava is an app where, um, it, you know, it, you track your runs, you track your workouts. And um, I, I love using these kinds of apps and like seeing, oh, this is what, what my path was and this, these were my splits and I think it's really fascinating. But what, um, what they found was that the default um, for Strava was to share publicly. And so military service members were un not noticing and defaultly sharing their data as they were doing their physical training around bases. And so it like lit up like a heat map all of the military bases around the globe, um, which is a huge national security risk. Um, okay, so now we're gonna move into some of the health equity issues. I'm gonna tell you a story um, about the, the Fitbit data from all of us and, and uh, what we saw there. Um, but I think this is, this is absolutely only one of the, the reasons why this is, um, this is a potential thing that we need to think about. Um, so as I mentioned, with the All of Us research program, the data that I worked on were a bring your own device model. So people had to have their own device um, and then they could donate it. So one of the things we were most interested in when we started looking at these data was, how do they compare, how do people that are donating Fitbit device to the program compare to people who, uh, in all of the, all people in the program in terms of diversity? Um, and you can see clear differences here. So um, in terms of race, um, you're, you're losing diversity when you look at the people in the Fitbit Bring Your Own Device program. Um, and so what we did was we launched a survey um, with uh, part of the consortium of the All of Us program is a, a network of federally qualified health centers. Um, so we launched a survey um, that was deployed at eight different um, FQHCs to learn uh, more about um, interest awareness um, of digital health technology devices. And, um, so this is, this is the paper um, that came out, I believe, last year. Um, and so this is just a breakdown of, uh, you know, kind of some of the socioeconomic um, factors, race, race and ethnicity, um, and education. And you can see that, you know, of the people that we surveyed in this, um, you know, we were really trying to reach, you know, diverse populations to, to get their attitudes and, um, and feedback. Um, and, and the punchline was, Majority of people do not have fitness trackers or wearable devices, not shocking. Um, and the number one barrier is cost. Again, not shocking, but really important to have that information. Um, and you know, there were some helping factors uh, when I was kind of surprised when we asked, um, you know, would you be willing to donate your Fitbit data or whatever device data to a research program? Uh, most people said yes. Um, so there is, there is an interest, um, there is a baseline awareness, um, and I think you know, this is why public-private partnerships are so critical in this space, is because people don't have these devices, um, and, and potentially people who, who could benefit from it the most um, are the ones who, who don't have them. So what is a future vision, uh, given all of this, um, of digital health technologies and health, and how do we get there? Um, so what do I even mean by health? And we, we talked about this a little bit already. Um, really, I see health as, as much more than clinical encounters, and I think we, we all do. Um, it's meeting you where you are in everyday life, and it's impossible to stay connected to your clinical care team all the time, right? But it's very possible to wear a device that can you know, figure out if there's anything going different with you. Um, I think it's also incredibly important to infer a set of physiological baseline parameters. 
Um, so, you know, just recently um, I was having a doctor appointment because I hadn't gone in years. Um, and, and they talked about, oh, well, we should get a, maybe we should get an A1C. And, and they were like, well, it's probably not an issue. And I said, well, but take it anyway because it'd be good to have a baseline, right? Um, and I think that's something that we don't do enough um, in clinical practice. And I think digital health technologies could help with that. Um, I also really think that this signal to test model is really great um, or signal to, for you to do something, for you to do something deeper with your health. Um, uh, I think there are gonna be potentially a lot of applications there. Again, I think when we're thinking about precision medicine, it has the opportunity to help us to think about the environmental lifestyle factors and, and how we can make better decisions at, um, ourselves. Um, and you know, another thing that's inherent in this um, that I, I, you know, is kind of my sense of it is that I think we're, we're often eager to go to a doctor and have them fix us, you know, give us a pill, tell us what's wrong. But who knows me and my body better than me? No one. And I think we need to start considering clinicians and doctors and our care team as our ad potential advisors, but really owning our own health. Um, and I think you know, this is where these technologies can really help. Okay, so I'm gonna give you two examples from my life. The first one is um, my fitness journey. So I came to fitness um, not until I was in grad school. Um, and um, and, and I, I kind of just did it on my own. I didn't have a team. I didn't have a trainer. Um, I just started doing things. Um, and then, you know, towards, and that was okay in my 20s and 30s. Um, I got into triathlons. Um, I did a bunch of races. I started running longer distances. Um, and then in my 40s, I started getting injured over and over again, stress fractures and, you know, other types of issues. Um, and so, and it wasn't, it, so I, I started to change the way that I was, I was doing fitness. Um, and one of those changes was I got a Peloton. Um, and I, I love Peloton. Um, but one of the things that I love about it the most is this power zone training program. So um, power zone training um, involves, again, finding a, a baseline. So you do a test called the functional threshold power test. And, um, and that gives you kind of, you know, where you should be working in terms of intensity. And then you're able to use those zones to do personal training at scale where, you know, they have programs and they help you, um, help you to go into that. So, so this, these are just a couple examples of, you know, on the top, you know, a more kind of even endurance kind of a workout. And on the bottom, you know, you're really trying to, to grow your, your threshold power. Um, but I think one of the things that, that is so helpful about this for me is that it takes uh, a little bit of the judgment about it outside of myself, um, and it allows me to think a little bit more rationally about how I'm treating my body, how I'm training, you know, those different types of stress um, that I'm withstanding, um, and it gives you access to personal training at scale, and gosh, wouldn't it be great if we all had access to like personal health coaches um, at scale? So the other example from my life is, um, this is Noah, um, he is my, he's my third chicken, um, and he's the only child that I ever had that actually looked like a chicken when he was born. Um, because he, um, in the first trimester, um, we had a, a cytomegalovirus exposure. Um, and so by 28 weeks, um, he was not growing, um, and the, the placenta stopped functioning, was getting totally attacked by the virus. So he was born, he was one pound 10 ounces. Um, it was a fascinating time. I feel like I earned a certificate in um, neonatology during that time. I just did so much research about all of this stuff. Um, but Noah's doing great. Um, so you can see, um, I included the picture of him, you know, when he was just probably about a week old because I call that time the time when I had really big hands <laughs> because in all of the pictures, you know, you have to put a hand there for scale. He was so tiny, his whole hand uh, would wrap around the last digit of my pinky. Um, because he loved to hold hands, but it was, wasn't really holding hands. It was him holding my, my pinky. Um, but anyway, so a lot of things can happen with cytomegalovirus um, infection long term. Um, hearing loss is one of them. Um, it's uh, cerebral palsy. Um, there are a lot of different cognitive delays and things like that. And Overall, Noah is doing great. So that was recently, uh, just a couple weekends ago, we had a princess sleepover. Um, he loves princesses and wearing princess dresses and singing princess songs. Um, and he's just truly delightful. 
Um, and we're starting to notice, you know, what are the things that are going to be unique to Noah? You know, he is my N of 1. Um, he is his own kind of amalgamation of health issues. Um, and one of them that has happened over the last few months is that a couple times he had what looked like a viral illness um, where he was fevering and kind of cycling with fevers. And with that came uncontrolled whole body movement. Um, so not a seizure, he was completely conscious and terrified because he felt like he was being attacked. You know, he wasn't moving his body and yet he was moving all over the place and getting thrown around and knocked around. Um, so, you know, again, doing a, a bunch of research. But I bring this up because one of the, the potential issues around here is his sleep patterns um, and trying to understand more deeply, you know, what are the triggers for these types of events? Um, how is that going to progress? How can we anticipate that? Um, and what can we do? And so I'm actually doing my own research on these kind of kid, um, you know, kind of uh, devices that are geared more towards the seizure management um, to, to try to help me um, to, to understand, understand my little Noah. Okay, so how do we realize the potential? There are a lot of things here. I'm going to go through this quickly so we can get to questions. Okay. And um, the Digital Medicine Society is uh, one that's really helping. It's a nonprofit professional society um, that's really convening people across the public and private sector, um, trying to do a lot of this standards work. Um, and then, you know, FDA is, is also doing stuff, um, but I think we also need to, to think about um, security in a lot more of a proactive fashion. Um, how do we do it equitably? Um, certainly human-centered human design, public-private partnerships. Um, and then, you know, another equity issue is even access to the basics, even broadband um, is still an issue. Um, and so coming back to the key themes in closing, I added one. Um, curiosity about ourselves I think is critical in this space. You know, anytime you're trying to evolve something new, um, I think that's really the most interesting. Um, and then I'll just leave you with this really fun infographic. <laughs> Thanks. Wonderful talk. And I, my, I'm sure everyone's question is, um, which uh, device should we each get? Um, <laughs> clearly, you couldn't choose between. We should, we should write an AI for that, <laughs> like a, you know. Um, we are running a little short on time, but I think we have time for a couple questions, and I see um, a hand raised over there. Hi. Um, so first, by quick disclaimers, I work in digital health. I'm a Zoogler, worked at Google Life Sciences oh, and Brady Life Sciences. Awesome. And anything I say right now does not represent my current employer. <laughs> so, <very clear. laughs> um, so two things, I think, from what you mentioned that for me are, are super critical in this space, and I'll call one an easy question, maybe one a hard question. The easy question, because you mentioned like heart rate, truth and truth standards in the, all the stuff are actually, you know, doctors think they know the truth, but they yeah. don't really know truth, right? And so one is obviously a huge challenge, right to your point about even like heart rate variation across devices. I'll pick on blood pressure. Five MDs in this room will measure me with five different blood pressures, and their assistants will measure me even with more variation in blood pressure. So yep. that's just one, like there's a huge challenge there in just how do you really build the proof standards. But to me, more than, the more interesting question, which I think ties back to AI in particular, um, I would argue that in this whole space, the human medical community really doesn't know what to do with it, right? Yes. If I, I have a Garmin watch, if I gave my daily Garmin data to my doc, she'd just give me a blank stare. I was like, why are you giving this to me, right? Um, but that actually, say, an AI doc who took all that data and could actually look at it real time all the time and give me very clean actionable things like, hey, go to bed a little bit earlier, or lay off the fourth glass of wine at you know, Black Belly yep. last night, um, <laughs> would be much more actionable and useful. And you, know, and you mentioned a lot about the raw data, which I think as a researcher and as a PhD, that's very interesting, but for the normal human layperson who wasn't represented and you bring your own device, actually that's useless to them, right? They need like, yep. hey, lay off the soda, you know, and, and get some fruit, right? Or go for a walk, and, and that where I think and I don't know if you've seen any of this yet of like, hey, can we build a really AI doctor? They already passed the yeah. medical exam, right? Um, that really, then I say, yeah, I opt in and that's the AI doc every morning or every evening or even every hour tells me to go do this or go do that or lay off that third chocolate chip cookie also outside in the, you know, in the area. Yeah. So what are kind of, yeah, what, how are you, 
thinking or looking at, yeah, hey, AI can, can should AI really just leapfrog the professional medical human professional yeah. medical community of today, um, and leave them to cut us open when they, we need to. Yeah, so great points. Um, and I do think that a lot is going to change in the next few years in this space. Um, I actually think that it's an opportunity um, to think about, you know, maybe we need digital health coaches, right? Maybe we actually need um, platforms that do rely on AI in some ways, but that also have a human involved in that process. Um, and really, the ultimate human is the wearer, because you know, if you're not disclosing to the, the platform that you're drinking soda, or that you're having three cookies or four glasses of wine, it's not gonna know that that's an issue, right? And I think I that's where the... Sure, 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 yeah. The, the alcohol, sure, yeah, potentially, in the, down, the, down the line, yeah, no, totally. Um, but, but I think that you know, the, the, um, what we're trying to do is get to things that are useful, right? And I, I totally hear your point and totally agree. You're not gonna take your data to your doctor. Um, they're not gonna know what to do. with. Even if you take your genomic sequence data to a doctor, you know, they don't usually know what to do with it. Um, so I do think that we're gonna have to evolve that space in terms of how do we get to the useful information? And, and is that, um, you know, again, I really think that the individual needs to be that at the center of that, of like, give me the useful information and then I will seek my doctor's advice. Um, but I think that, that depending on where your context and where you're coming from, you may need additional support on that front, right? And you, and you may need other types of consultants to, to help with that. But I do think that that's one of the areas that we're going is, is kind of digital health coaching um, in that space. Um, and even potentially in outfitting homes with health technology that's embedded um, into, the, into the home might be also. Wonderful, we, are, we have time for one quick one. Go ahead, down here. What about the danger of medical profiling, particularly if the data is not holistic? You know, if you don't have all the data, and, and some, I mean, you kind of answered the question with a, with a coach, right? But if, the, if all this data is being absorbed by your, by your doctor and misused because there's not enough data and they profile you into a class and, and, you know, and in the United States where we're not universal health care, you know, you're going to get charged extra for, you know, it'd be nice if you could get charged for that fourth glass of wine right online, but, you know. Yeah, you know, so far I don't think wearables data are getting ingested into um, health care provider organizations, um, except in some very few cases. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's, a, that's an open question. There are a lot of open questions in this space. Wonderful. Thank you, Michelle. Let's Thanks give her so another hand. Okay, we'll take a short break and meet back here at 11.15. <laughs>